associate the independent professional services for expert transfer pricing uh, uh, valuation and custom services uh, with uh, global network covering more than 50 countries uh, around the world providing independent services of course uh, we have uh, uh, we have a bill from uh, pharma biosource Inc., which is in the United States, a pharmaceutical and biotech uh, capacity and facility tra transaction services, a consulting company, you know, uh, specialized in the pharma and the life science industry. It's in uh, capacity. And I'm Yariv from uh, the Israeli partner of Transfer Pricing Associate. Uh, our office name <coughs> is Bart V. N. Bendov. Uh, we provide uh, for, uh, we provide transfer pricing uh, services. Uh, we are also expertise in uh, pharmaceutical, um, and uh, we have a full collaboration uh, with the transfer pricing uh, associate. Uh, so this webinar, as mentioned, is actually a joint venture of these uh, three companies, and all this uh, Pharma Academy uh, will be a joint venture. So we can uh, continue, and again, I welcome everybody and hope you enjoy it. So uh, we're going to talk about pharmaceutical, of course. So, you know, uh, pharmaceutical today is one of the most targeted issues of the tax authorities worldwide, and that's uh, very unique to this industry. You know, we hear about many court cases. Uh, there are very a lot of issues in the news and things like that. And also the pharmaceutical world era has been changed in the last couple of uh, years. In fact, we have examined a couple of studies and we figure out that about 80% of top executives of pharmaceutical companies that participated in such studies, they believe that the pharmaceutical industry today is expecting, experiencing a strategic crisis. This was the exact word, the crisis, a disaster. And out of those people who responded to those studies, you know, most of them see improvements in their operating models as the solution to overcoming this uh, 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 crisis. And although many companies remain dependent on mature markets, we see that those executives are predicting that pharmaceutical companies will increasingly invest in emerging market. And of course, this will take place across all functions from GNA to R&D and commercial and operation, but most managers have not yet moved to a line. This is also from our experience when we have a lot of talks with those managers when we are doing their transfer pricing studies and also have seminars with them. We figure out that those managers have not yet moved to align their operation models with either the life cycle of the products or the life cycle of the market in which they operate. So we are... Uh, facing in the pharmaceutical uh, uh, <clears throat> world a true challenge here, and we thought it would be a very good idea uh, to dedicate uh, a series of webinars, actually five webinars, that will tackle this issue and uh, will address those very challenging issues. And <clears throat> I will just uh, give you, because it's the first webinar, I will just give you a very short brief about all those five webinars and then we continue. So the first webinar will be about Patent Cliff. This is today's webinar, so we, of course we're going to touch, it, touch that in a couple of seconds. Um, next month we're going to have a webinar that will uh, face the issue of the infrastructuring of an in-license IPR, um, because you know we witness more in-license R&D agreements with specialty soft universities, and in the process of structuring those IPR, the multinational seems to prefer the creation, uh, you know, sometimes of uh, centralized hubs for IP or principal uh, structure. And we will explore uh, during this webinar the potential options that will soften the effect on high costs uh, in low tax uh, jurisdiction and will touch some very uh, interesting uh, models. <clears throat> that will be, again, uh, uh, next month. And uh, you already have the date, so you're welcome to register. And of course, more announcement will follow that. Uh, I believe in September, you know, because uh, in the summer holiday, of course, everybody is busy uh, with the summer holiday most of the time. 
so I believe in September, but again, this will be announced. We will have the third webinar that will be connected to biosimilars. And, uh, and you know, contrary to the traditional generics, all this development of biosimilars is much more complex and expensive and requiring clinical trials and approval for each major indication. So we are going to speak and demonstrate about the issue of what is going to be the market outlook for this, and will the pharmaceuticals actually be confronted with big debt, uh, no revenue risk, and all that matters. The following uh, webinar uh, title is Can You Leverage from a Purchase Price Allocation from a Transfer Pricing Perspective? And then we're going to touch, you know, all this definition of tangible, intangible, which is the, like the hottest stuff today in, in transfer pricing, OECD, and everything. So we're going to talk about uh, the definition of intangible for transfer pricing purposes. Uh, we're going to touch uh, definitions like goodwill for pharmaceutical companies. And we're going to test how everything is uh, demonstrating uh, accounting rules versus tax and transfer pricing and how to manage the risk of running a high effective tax rate. And the last seminar, webinar, in the academy would be how to analyze the economics of pipelines in the pharmaceutical industry from DCS, the discount and cash flow, to real option valuation model. And I, I think this is a very special webinar because, um, you know, as we know that pipelines continue to comprise the largest portion of the total value of pharmaceutical companies, uh, then uh, uh, within this framework, the applicability of prevailing methods in corporate capital budgeting systems, such as the DCF, of course, which we all know about. You know, most of the, of course, valuation is made using the TCF. But, you know, DCF is now also being questioned. And alternatively, the notion of high uncertainty and volatility in future cash flows. So maybe we can be also doing using real option valuation model, but this consider much too aggressive. So in this webinar, we will demonstrate a very special and unique mid approach that uh, will actually uh, uh, combine those DCF and uh, real option. We also further analyze all transfer pricing and valuation aspects relevant in uh, situations um, where the IP entity attempts to ship R&D, for example, expenses, so as not to give away uh, valuable Excuse me, uh, Yariv? tax sheets. Yes. Yariv, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. But uh, at least uh, from my uh, from my end, I cannot hear you very clearly. There's some uh, problem. So if you can, uh, is now it's know. is now it's better? Uh, no, it's still. I think we still have a a little problem. I don't know. Is the other so what? Hear you as well. Do you all? Uh, are you all unable to hear, hear Yariv clearly? Safe, Bill? Uh, this is Bill Wiedersheim. I, it, uh, it's fairly good, but not great. Okay. okay. Fairly good is, right. is good. And, 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 and so can I continue? Yes, yes, please. All right. I, I will try uh, also to speak up. Although I'm speaking, I think, very loudly right now. And I also be closer uh, uh, to the phone if you think uh, uh, that uh, could help. All right. So, uh, so this is uh, what we're going to do basically in uh, in those uh, uh, webinars, and we're going to uh, now start uh, with everything concerned to patent cliff because you know uh, we know that uh, as we also demonstrated that today with the generic companies and with the recent action from uh, President Obama, what we call the, Pre the pa Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. So we know that between 2011 and 2014, 98 billion in branded products are expected to lose patent protection as they approach the edge of what we call the patent cliff. So less and less multinational will have the ideal portfolio of patent drugs. So um, we're going to speak right now about what uh, will be some of the transfer pricing consequences of uh, all those issues and all uh, those results and what will happen in this market and uh, what we think uh, could be the most challenging issues of transfer pricing and other issues. I would just like to mention technically to all participants 
that if someone would like to ask a question to all the panelists, which I just demo which I just introduced, or to a certain panel panelist in our webinar, then you can press. You have that box there on the top, and you can press chat. And when you press chat. You can choose whether you want to chat and ask a question to a certain member of the panel or ask a question to all participants of the panel. And we're going to answer this uh, question uh, uh, right after we finish the webinar or even uh, during um, uh, uh, the webinar. So uh, we will start now with the patent cliff, and we'll talk about, again, what is patent cliff, the alternative business model, the shift from IP to COGS, new other focus on R&D and the alternative investment strategy. So as we see, you know, this is, you know, these slides contain all those things that we've been now, you know, in the news and, and things that are very interesting. You know, you, you, we can see now AstraZeneca, uh, what's happening there. Uh, take a look at Merck. Merck, the famous company, has been grappling with the loss of exclusivity for a blockbuster drug. So in Merck's case, sales are under pressure because it lost patent protection last year for asthma and allergy treatment singular, leading to generic competition that wiped out much of the drugs, more than $5 billion in peak annual sales. And um, we have certain threats here, uh, you know, and the threat here is that companies reduced revenue stream, and we have increased competition and price cuts, and as a result, motivates consolidation in the industry. We just read a couple of days ago um, uh, that uh, Activist is going to buy Werner Ch uh, Chilcott in five billion dear, uh, dollar, and this is not for just a reason, because many M&A deals today in collaboration are aimed at expanding companies' portfolio in priority uh, areas. And in this regard, I would just like to mention this uh, recent acquisition because this is so hot from the oven. And we, uh, we know that the generic drug, drug, drug maker Activist Inc., which is itself a recent takeover target, announced that it would buy a specialty pharmaceutical company called, again, Warner Chilcott for $5 billion in stock. And the reason they want to do that is to expand its branded drug portfolio, lower their taxes, and increase profits. This is something all companies have to face. And... Uh, 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 plan nowadays. And this specifically acquisition brings two new businesses to Activize. One is gastroenterology and the other one is dermatology. And they also add uh, women health drugs like branded conservatives like for activists which makes and sells drugs that are no longer under patent protection. And it's important to mention that not only because it's so fresh from uh, the news right now, that because it, this is the second major purchase in the past two years for that company, which competes again against larger companies like Teva Pharmaceutical Industries. You know, Teva Pharmaceutical is the largest pharmaceutical company in the world today, and, and also Mylan Inc., and, and Teva has been doing that for quite a long time. This strategy has become Teva strategic for a couple of years now. You know, Teva uh, it was a couple of years the largest pharmaceutical drug maker in the world, but it has turned to acquiring specialty branded drugs, which have far uh, higher profit margin than generics because it would like to boost uh, 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 its, uh, its uh, earnings. So that's a very good example, and it's happening as we speak, as we speak. And what are uh, the threats and the opportunities that we're talking about, actually? We're talking about the situation when the European crisis affecting profit as governments, uh, you know, would like to cut spending on health care. Uh, the cuts may come uh, in many forms, for example. One example, uh, for example, could be the various regulations in Eastern and Central European countries. Because we have regulation that actually limits the gross margin that the local distributors can earn. And additional barriers are reduction in government subsidies for affordable medicine. So production from the East is putting pressure on price, and this has to be taken into consideration. But we also have opportunities here, because, because, because governments are encouraging use of generics due to budget constraints, 
then uh, several countries uh, are proving incentives to develop generic version. So we, we, should have to, we have to know that the Western world is getting older as the life spam increases, and we mean that more people will consume medicine and for a longer period. So new areas of development will include various neurological research to improve life quality for what we call, of course, the golden age. So countries are reducing the barriers for generics in order to cut healthcare spendings. And we also have CRO. We have CROs, you know, a, a clinical research organization that perform more bio studies for generic version. We are moving from R&D uh, and we are outsourcing uh, 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 to uh, CRO. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. So this is the previous slide, okay. Okay. So we have that impact of patent clip on, of course, the R&D laboratory footprints and the production footprints and the sales channel. But the question is, what will be the transfer pricing consequences of focusing shift from return on R&D investment to cost of goods sold, and how are those going to be reflected also in the operating margin? So before we say a word about that, let's look at the bulleting in the right side of this slide. And we see that reduction in all major cost centers, such as manufacturing, supply chain, and, and GNA, we are talking about outsourcing or insourcing a number of operations. So um, everybody thinks about outsourcing, but we also have insourcing that's part of the current strategy. We have the incubator programs. This is very uh, uh, popular now, where also uh, p a lot of pharmaceutical companies, large like Pfizer, Merck, and also Teva, are invest in startups and have collaboration also with universities. And this collaboration would also affect uh, the second webinar we have, by the way. And we have the Six Sigma practice, this uh, approach, uh, the management, very famous management approach when it involves site closure, low-cost country sourcing. We have investment in vaccines. And we have retrieving margin. For example, Pfizer moved prescription drugs to the OTC market. So it's very important to know that when you are moving prescription drugs, from the regular market to the over-the-counter market. This involves also a lot of effort and a lot of issues and a lot of special R&D and regulation, but the results, of course, is the proven and most efficient result uh, in this uh, matter. If we're going back to the transfer pricing issue, so let's think about this specific transfer pricing impact. First of all, because of the complexities in the supply chain of generics, transfer pricing is a challenge. Because if we think about it, as we have the profit margin decreases on the entire supply chain, then the transfer pricing documentation, the studies that we, the pharmaceutical companies are doing, need to be more in explanation in defending more loss position. Because if you have a certain pharmaceutical company, when it used to be compensated with, for example, 10% uh, operating margin as a certain distributor with certain intangible or without intangible, you need now to explain to the tax authorities, and these tax authorities are becoming relentless and the number of transfer pricing audits is increasing. We are facing in our organization a lot of transfer pricing audits in pharmaceutical. So they would like to get explanation how come you have a certain margin and then this margin reduced so dramatically. And you have to touch your industrial analysis to show that the whole market is in problem. You have to restruct sometimes your business. You have to move from maybe full risk distributor to low risk distributor, but that's again a goodwill maybe question. You have to do a lot of things to defend your position with regard to your tax authority, sometimes even amend your intercompany agreement and policy. So in addition, in an effort to cut cost of production, companies are also investing in production lies in the, in the East, so India, for example, we're going to see what's happening in India. Um, so from a transfer pricing perspective, there is an effort, I would say, to simplify processes and uh, reduce costs. So, for example, and we're going to touch it also in the additional and the next webinars, 
So some companies uh, are doing establishment of regional hubs, for example, for invoicing. You know, this sounds very simple, but it's still something that in the end of the day can reduce costs. So we have a regional hub for inversing. We have logistical warehouse. So for example, we have a logistical warehouse that makes all the orders, receive all the orders from around the world for that particular pharmaceutical company, and then uh, handle these orders and transfer them into the relevant uh, distributor, for example. So let's move uh, for the next slide. Okay. So what's happening right here is that we are talking about, because we talked about all this issue, we are shifting from the intellectual property to cost of goods sold, because this is exactly what's happening right now. So we have the global health care reform that actually forces us sometimes uh, uh, to do so, and the lower return for shareholders and other investment. So what would be the possible effect, and everybody can see the graph right now when we are looking at the slowdown of growth in revenue and gross margin impact, and also we are looking at the compound annual growth ratio, and everybody can see the numbers that are actually uh, uh, going down there. And uh, um, we have government pressure impact today in emerging markets on the intercompany price. And the question is whether the price set by the government can actually reflect and arm legs, and we're going to uh, maybe speak about it uh, in a minute. And in addition, we have expectation of investors, because the investor today, that's an issue uh, per itself, investor uh, uh, today, with all this crazy R&D expensive, we would expect that the big pharma current level of R&D spending to become a luxury, because their investor would say we are no longer tolerate on that. We already see these signs today. As you know, some investors also and analysts, analysts believe that many of the big pharma R&D investments actually destroys the value. And also, the optimized supply chain versus optimized license income. So let's talk about it, uh, about it right now. This is very important. First of all, again, the government pressure impact in emerging markets on the intercompany price and the, is, the, uh, is the price set by the government can actually reflect an arm length. And there are many restrictions in emerging markets, but the OECD regs, according to our experience, our recent audits, and our recent work with pharmaceutical companies, we can say that the OECD regs are still applied and adapted. And therefore, there are transfer pricing solutions that we can find, and a, a good transfer pricing people can find for you, such as, for example, uh, performing transfer pricing adjustment, not through the COGS, but rather through the service. In other words, when most of the pharmaceutical companies or most companies uh, we know today performing transfer pricing adjustments through the COGS and by that also affecting the actual price and, of course, affecting the level of inventory and the right value of inventory, a couple of companies today, or many companies actually, because we are also experienced with that, have started to also to examine to do uh, transfer pricing adjustment through the services, through maybe the operating profit, through the operating expenses, and by that also find a new way to demonstrate why are they doing those transfer pricing adjustments to reduce risk. But again, this is something you have to consult uh, with the transfer pricing uh, uh, specialist. Regarding, this is very important, the optimized supply chain versus the optimized license income, and especially with companies that have complex supply chain, I think there is a growing need for principal company structure when the main reason is the impossible synchronization between operations and finance for thousands of stock keeping units. However, if we think about it, implementation of principal company requires very high investment and management support. And before I move to the next slide, I would like to ask um, uh, the other parties of the panel whether they would like to add or comment to that. Yeah, if, um, I like uh, this is Dave Hybrox of PPA. I like to uh, give uh, give a few comments here. I think the Please. Uh, the. Uh, a cumulative average growth rate of uh, of the gross margin um, being under pressure is is what this table seems to suggest. Although it's very hard from that one year 
uh, from this couple of years to to really determine a a a, um, a final position. And we will we will get to the facts or fictions by looking at some more empirical evidence later on. What what you see though is that uh, the change in business model uh, requires a a different focus. Uh, from everyone in the big pharma companies, and the the combination, for example, uh, what uh, what uh, Yarif has been uh, just uh, addressing, uh, if you have patented drugs and you have generics, uh, branded generics, in, in most cases, and you push them through the same distribution channel, uh, what is that going to do to the uh, the acceptable sGNA to sales uh, cost level you you would accept? Because the traditional model has been quite different from uh, from the new model, so I think that's one observation where uh, supply chain comes in uh, much more than it was uh, it was before. Um, I think I'll save the other comments for later. Yarif, uh, please proceed, and uh, unless Bill has any uh, uh, further uh, comments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steph. I would like to mention another thing that demonstrates all this also, if you look at bullet number uh, three in the possible effects, when you have the focus of the emerging market, for example, the Novartis. I don't know if you heard about the Novartis India court case, but, um, you know, many, many of, uh, of, uh, of drugs are unaffordable for patients in emerging uh, markets. And uh, Novartis was uh, facing a failed attempt to get patent protection for its cancer drug because in India, prescriptions are limited to generic drugs for the majority of publicity-insured patients. And we have to remember there that if no generic drugs are available, then the government can force foreign pharmaceutical companies, like in this case, to license their patent products as generics. And this was shown in the case of Novartis. And that was a big, very big issue that demonstrated everything uh, we are demonstrating uh, right now. So we can move, uh, with your permission, to the next slide. Okay, this particular slide, we can learn a lot from it. Look at the, about, look at the focus of R&D in the pharmaceutical industry. We have here... The fields in pharmaceutical, like the cardiovascular and the ID infective, the nervous system, respiratory, and the others, and we see the deviation between the research, the development, and uh, uh, the marketing here. And the question is, how are those R&D expenses will be allocated, or are they allocated there right now? So. Um, there's nothing for me very special to add in that because I think this slide speaks for itself when you can see the research and the development. Um, so I would say a couple of seconds to look at that and then we can, uh, unless someone else has to comment, we can move uh, to slide number eight. Okay, so the new other focuses on R&D right after we saw those very impressive numbers. So what's success role of R&D spend? So we have number of submission increases, and we have also the new molecule entities. You know, many, many products are, are duplicated today, but some are new and innovative chemical structures that was never used before in clinical practice. And we're talking about products that are new drugs that are often called in this way that in the end of the day will give a certain uh, hope uh, uh, for uh, the patient. And But we are still talking about compounds entering phase 3 decreases and R&D replaced by A and P because it's becoming very hard today to the manufacturer generics in this case due to legal situation in many countries because the, those ethical pharma companies are actually have automatically filing for patents in competitors' countries for operation, which makes, in this case, a very easy for them right to approach. And still, those companies are much more uh, uh, affected 
by uh, other generic companies in their uh, patent cliff. So everything we are talking right now is focuses on R&D um, in order to create the opportunities and reduce uh, the threat. If we can move to the next slide. Okay, so what would be a couple of examples for alternative investment strategies? What makes pharmaceutical companies attractive from an investor perspective? First of all, increasing opportunities in generic and branded generics. And it's very important to understand the nature of the branded generics. Because if we're talking about the branded generic, you're talking about basically a drug that is be equivalent to the original product. That's, of course, still a generic issue. But now it is being marketed under another company brand name. And the branded generics are an attractive business uh, for the emerging markets today operation because they enjoy actually low research and development costs compared to the other ones. And also sustainable sales in that have already faced the patent expiry of traditional pharmaceutical compounds. But we have also to remember something very that a lot of innovative products didn't realize, that also generic companies have today an in a, a generic R&D. And a generic R&D spending will never be the spending of an innovative R&D. But still, we are talking about a very unique R&D, and also with the crisis today that also affect also generic pharmaceutical, those companies also are shifting to, for example, clinical research organization as compared to also to the ethical uh, pharmaceutical. And we have the longer life and increased drug consumption. We talked about the government healthcare reform. And again, the patent cliff, approximately 150 billion of drugs are going off patent. And the investment options that are valuable in this type, of course, are on equity shareholders' return, the venture capital and the private equity, but also, as we talked about, uh, talked about the incubator programs that are very popular today, so investment in startup and the rationalized pipeline uh, management. And uh, now we're going to move uh, to the next uh, slide and the next subject, and I am proud to uh, give the speech to uh, Stef. Go ahead and uh, thank you. Thanks, Yoris. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, we are now getting back uh, to uh, uh, the slides of, of facts or fiction. So we did some research, and uh, we, if we could move to the next slide um, on the quantification of uh, the, the various uh, sales levels uh, and sales growth levels, um, also the operating margin and the R&D spend which are sort of instrumental in, in the whole analysis. If you, if you look at the sales growth, uh, which is an indication of, uh, of how the value of a company could potentially grow uh, for, for future purposes, you see a uh, significantly higher growth rate for the peer group, uh, uh, we, which we call generics versus the patented uh, pharmaceutical companies which is an indication that uh, the generics are, are doing some catching up. Uh, it's, it's not consistent, and there's uh, quite a, a volatility if you see also the growth rate in the year 2010. Um, so uh, I think an observation from my end, especially if you look at 2012, there there is some reason for concern if your sales growth is, is being bent to, to negative for patented and still being... Uh, a generous 16 plus percent for uh, for the generics. So this gives you uh, at least a feeling of what the uh, market is uh, is moving towards. If we then take the next slide and we we look at the operating margin, um, we we are recognizing the operating margin to be significantly higher. Um, if if you look at uh, 24, 25, and and it it, it is not eroding as fast as uh, the patent cliff story initially seems to indicate, uh, particularly also I I believe because it takes a very long time. If you do the investment in R and D, you build up a stable cash flow base and an operating margin, um, 
with uh, aligns with your uh, your operating expense uh, over a long period of time. So it's not like you you're out of business tomorrow. Although some of the uh, earlier cases uh, you referred to tell for some individual big pharma company a different story. The difference roughly on the on the margin we uh, we uh, have uh, uh, noticed uh, is a roughly 10%. So it it would be kind of nice to now look at the next slide, which is uh, addressing the um, R&D to sales ratios between generics, again, and, uh, and the uh, patented pharmaceutical companies. And if you, if you take a very simple approach to that, uh, the uh, roughly 10% more uh, R&D spent by the patented uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, seem to be le seem to be delivering a a generous 100% return in the sense of 100% operating margin in the, in the in the previous slide. So that's that's one way of looking at it. Uh, the other way of looking at it, and that's coming back to the earlier slide, yeah, we've showed on the gross margin and especially the cumulative average growth rate uh, being uh, being eroded. Uh, at, at this stage, if the gross margin, for example, would go down from 50 to 60% in the, in the, at, the, at the level of the patented pharmaceutical companies, you would be, um, if that would erode, for example, from 60 to 50 uh, over a period of time, and the big pharma companies would not be able to streamline their their supply chain, EA uh, are stuck with uh, with uh, the same level of uh, COX and, and, and OPEX, then obviously that um, erosion of the gross margin eventually would lead to an erosion of your um, operating margin. Um, I believe that's, uh, that's an illusion because there's really a buildup over a, a long number of years. There's a buildup of a portfolio of, uh, of patents. Um, and and um, as uh, our, our colleague Bill Wiedersheim, who unfortunately had to leave for uh, for uh, for another webinar, um, uh, was indicating already, he does not believe that erosion will will go that quick because there's also a different attitude on regulatory issues between the, the patented pharmaceutical companies and the, and the, the peer group generics, in uh, that uh, there is a a um, a longer-standing relationship and a, a, a much more defined process in the, in the, at the level of the patented pharmaceutical companies on, uh, on getting approval uh, for some of, uh, of, uh, of their drugs compared to the uh, pretty fresh and young uh, generation of uh, generic pharmaceutical companies. Again, this, this is, though, showing some trends and uh, some potential threats also being uh, being reflected in the in the in the sense of uh, of margins uh, uh, gross margin going down. If you don't rationalize your uh, your cost, then obviously your bottom margin goes down. If your bottom line margin, your operating margin is eroding with uh, a significant amount, then obviously it would um, not. Pay off anymore to do R and D activities at the at the same scale and level you're doing today. So that's uh, sort of the balancing act we're looking at. Any questions from the audience uh, or any side remarks from your side, Pierre? That was uh, demonstrated very well. I, I would like uh, later on or uh, to comment uh, again about uh, the R and D difference between the generic and the ethical because I think that's got a lot of influence and also to speak in this regard uh, one couple of centers about uh, the chemical equivalent of the branded drug. I'm just checking on the chat. Uh, no questions at this moment. Uh, feel free to, uh, to, send, uh, to send your comments or questions to, uh, to TPA to State hybrid or, or Yarif in case you have any any questions. Okay. Um, we move to the next slide. The very simple definitions of smarter companies is companies who want to drive growth um, and who are looking at uh, a 
parts of their supply chain being underperforming so to to create better performance uh, which uh, eventually will lead to more profits uh, as as a consequence of which you protect and enhance the value of the enterprise uh, if we uh, would be looking at the at the next slide for what dilemmas um, and, and uh, the, the the big pharma companies are faced with on these three variables. Then uh, drive growth. I, I think one of the dilemmas is: um, Do I need to spend uh, more or less money on on R and D if I spend 15%? And currently, this operating margin return shows me 100% return because I'm 10% uh, more profitable. I'm, I'm spending 10% more R&D to sales ratio than the generics, but as a consequence, I'm also getting a 10% uh, better operating margin return um, on on my uh, running business. Is that a sufficient ground to continue at the same level of R&D? Or are the changes in the industry? I don't know what this uh, court case in uh, in India, uh, patent cliffs on uh, on certain uh, positions uh, at certain big pharma companies really threatening your sales uh, sales level. Is that uh, going to be? Um, is, is that going to force you to move to more branded generics where you will will replace at a certain point in time your R and D if the R and D is not. Um, bringing enough return anymore, you will shift to an, uh, an A&P, an advertising and promotional um, uh, setup uh, to replace R&D. The uh, um, A&P there on, on uh, branded generics um, is very hard to measure. Uh, there's not a lot of empirical evidence. We've, we've looked at it and uh, it's all hiding uh, underneath SGNA at, uh, at most companies. Um, so it's, it's not uh, at this stage easy to measure whether the AMP of generics is um, is higher than the, the AMP to sales ratio spent by generics is higher than at the level of the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but it, this is an, an inherent dilemma from what we looked at before, and I would like to invite the Arif and also the audience to uh, to comment on this that dilemma whether what I stated just now makes sense or is totally different from uh, if you look at it from a different perspective. Well, uh, thank you, Steph. I totally agree with what you said. And I think uh, that uh, today the branded generic is actually the key aspect to that because the branded generic in the end of the day is some kind of a combination between the word, of course, branded and generics. And in the end of the day, I think that innovative, uh, innovative uh, companies uh, that again faces crazy R and D costs that have to face uh, lower operating margin and lower return on those costs and R and D, and also to face their investor will have to uh, to do all the strategies that you just mentioned. I would like to, uh, just like to explain um, regarding the generic that as as chemical equivalents of branded generics, we have to note that the generic drugs the generic drugs are generally appear in the pharmaceutical market let's say upon expiration of the patent on uh, correlating branded prescription drugs and although in the USA they provide a 20 years patent term we have to remember that the effective patent life for branded drugs in the states also average only 8 to 10 years due to the fact that those patents are often for API. API means active pharmaceutical ingredients. That's, that's actually the raw material of the generics of, of, of uh, the drugs. And those APIs are developed prior to the finalization of the drugs. And once this patent expires and the generic drugs are introduced, the profitability of the branded drugs erodes rapidly and the collision of the generic and branded pharmaceutical space I think it's actually created changes in the lands landscape of the medicine because the pricing pressures and the overall industry expansion have increased the market competition. So we are, if you are talking about R&D, as generic drugs companies, they do not have the proportionality high R&D that costs that normally incur by the branded drug develops, even after the discounts and price erosion and everything that are experienced by the generic market. They still 
can still earn a competitive return on an expenditure, and this thing has a huge effect on everything, and therefore the key is actually what you say, the brand, the generics, and these are uh, the most common strategies that we are facing right now. Okay, Yari, thanks, thanks very much. I think uh, next to growth, uh, I think performance, especially uh, intriguing, is the performance of the R&D and, 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 and looking at the big pharma companies, uh, the, the most focus almost um, has to be next to the supply chain, uh, which we touched, is on the, on the big spending on R&D. So are you investing in own R&D? Is the return on R&D sufficient um, if we um, if we uh, seen in the earlier uh, slides? I'm just looking at one of the earlier slides that that there is a <coughs> pressure on the number of uh, uh, compounds entering phase uh, phase three. If if that's the case, uh, is that also a uh, does that have an impact on, on your R&D spend? Because if, if you can't get enough uh, compounds uh, entering phase three, then uh, apparently your payback on R&D is not the payback it should should have been. And then you get sort of the dilemma, which uh, I'd like to uh, to introduce on the, on, the, on this performance uh, based uh, uh, strategy. Are you not better off outsourcing? Uh, if if you take examples, I believe Pfizer is one of them. You take um, an equity stake in, in, uh, at a, um, a startup and see whether it works. If it doesn't work, uh, you uh, you abort it. Uh, and if it does work, you you are uh, have a relatively low investment in something which could uh, grow to become a very valuable uh, uh, patent. So what is what is sort of the dilemma? Uh, what are the main considerations for this dilemma, Yeri? If you think in the in the in the near future, the next uh, one to five years. Well, first of all, I totally agree that a lot of companies today, and actually also in the last couple of years, already uh, were thinking about whether to uh, to outsource their R and D and use the CRO, CMO, and uh, uh, CSO and everything. Uh, in uh, in uh, this regard, uh, the, well, I was interviewing. In fact, this is quite interesting. I was interviewing some of uh, the, the most uh, 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 you know, important uh, directors in uh, three f major pharmaceutical companies: one in Israel and uh, two in the United States. Actually, uh, they say they are still hesitating whether one to source their R and D. Uh, uh, to outsource their R and D, and two, how much of this R and D. Uh, to source, because uh, first of all, uh, they also talked about the level of control they have, and also uh, the control of uh, IP and other uh, issues. The other thing is that uh, one company was audited in front of the tax authorities uh, because they were outsourced uh, to a CRO, but this CRO was an intercompany CRO, which received in the end of the day a cost plus remuneration where the tax authorities claim it actually doing more than a regular cost plus and entitles to a more, far more residual profit and the transfer pricing study uh, didn't explain it well. But this is a very unique situation. Most companies uh, today are uh, realizing that uh, to keep a full R&D function uh, when the branded generics and generic are just in their neck all the time uh, sometimes could be not a very good to do and they are uh, indeed outsourcing uh, uh, these uh, uh, R&D, but keeping a certain uh, lack of in, a certain investment in their uh, or in, uh, in their own R&D. So I think the right approach here at the moment, as we see it in pharmaceutical companies and in practice, is a certain balance between that and not to do uh, 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 black or white. Okay, thanks, Sharif. Uh, the last point on this uh, strateg strategic dilemma is uh, w would you go for uh, as as a big pharma company? Would you say, okay, I need uh, to focus on these designer drugs where I would use uh, nano equipment and techniques to more um, uh, customize uh, the, the medicine to uh, to to the patient, um, or would I go for the the, the classical way of uh, small molecules, or would I go for uh, the biosimilars? Um, 
that dilemma, I think, uh, has been uh, on the uh, less less seen as a dilemma. It's uh, you see companies, big pharma companies, making a a strategic move in one or the other directions, um, where it is not clear from the outset what will be the surviving strategy or the uh, the, the strategy which uh, which makes you uh, belong to the the survival of the of the fittest. Um, I would like Yarif and maybe also people in the audience their view on things because I see big pharma companies making a, a more and more conscious uh, strategic move in one or the other direction. Well, uh, first of all, uh, regarding uh, this strategy, the value of enterprise, the designer versus the small and the large and the biosimilar, uh, uh, we will also address that in uh, the upcoming webinars and we touch that specifically issue. Um, in the strategy of the pharmaceutical companies, uh, we are working uh, with them uh, 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 today. There is a very trend move to indeed go to the designer uh, style, but to do it as a segmented business and not to give up the small or the large uh, uh, molecule. And this also involves IP question in the end of the day. And as we see today that many very famous companies and not necessarily pharmaceuticals are in the news today are facing a very harsh transfer pricing uh, uh, and international tax audit. Uh, we have uh, these pharmaceutical companies know and indeed they are doing and are taking into consideration um, uh, what type of uh, of the value of enterprise they would like to develop, and, uh, and 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 it's proven to be something that they haven't decided. Most of the companies haven't decided yet on a clear strategy. You know, we have also interviews in TPA with Pfizer and with other companies, and they're saying yes, we are going this way. Uh, it sounds very good, but we are going there very carefully because uh, we still have a lot of expenses. Uh, and we are also uh, checking other uh, issues. So, again, like in the things of the investment in honor and the autos are, and the also the value of enterprise today, because mostly of the patent cliff and the branded generics, uh, will be affected by so many factors. And uh, uh, we're going to touch uh, some of them, but very detailed in the next uh, webinars. Very good, Jerry. Uh, let's move to the next slide. We, uh, uh, the, the first block we uh, addressed, what is the patent cliff and what, what, is it, uh, what triggered the patent cliff and what the, are the consequences and what are the alternative strategies of uh, companies to look at that. The second block we looked at facts and fictions, um, three very simple quantitative measures to look at the market and uh, split it up between generics and patented. The third block we uh, we just addressed were some of the strategic uh, dilemmas uh, all pharma companies are faced with, and uh, just to make sure we we have connected that with uh, with positions uh, taken by the uh, by the industry, um, we uh, we pulled out some quotes uh, recent quotes of uh, a few firms which were very explicit about their strategy going forward to see where. What we just discussed uh, also is the intention, the true intention, uh, uh, at least written intention by the uh, big pharma companies and uh, in this case one generic company. If you look at AstraZeneca, uh, all the statements on early stages research deals, global partnerships and licensing and bold on acquisitions which, uh, which we highlighted uh, all seems to be rationalizing um, their R&D activities. Uh, subsequently, they say we need to optimize and restructure some of our activities, which seems to indicate um, as a second priority, streamline supply chain. Uh, so, although this seems generic, it gives uh, different words uh, to the underlying current. If you look at Sanofi on the on the right side, we see the targeting of uh, of acquisitions and alliances and uh, streamlining of R&D. Um, all are like, okay, we need to build a, a healthy pipeline, either through acquisitions and alliances. Uh, at the same time, we need to streamline our R&D structures. 
Why? Because uh, we, we need to integrate after we acquire these companies the, the R&D cycle uh, to, to stay within a, a certain bandwidth on R&D to sales ratios being, being spent. And uh, not surprising, uh, we need to have a tight control on our SG&A expenses as well. So you see some similarities on the strategic statements uh, taken from, uh, from websites and, uh, and annual reports. If, uh, if we look at the next slide, we, uh, we see Pfizer. Um, funny enough, uh, they, they, are, uh, they seem to be more, in, in recent statements, uh, uh, focused on, on, uh, on a, an efficient supply chain. Manufacturing efficiencies, managing our expenses, and and uh, here I found uh, the statement quite quite interesting by the uh, worldwide head of R and D of Pfizer that their their focus is really on biosimilars, uh, which which is one of the elements and dilemmas we uh, we have been uh, addressing um, just a few slides ago. If we take a totally different stance and we look at the generics and we took Tiva as, uh, as a reference, uh, the, the Israeli-based based company, uh, we see um, that size matters, uh, a focus on small and mid-sized deals to grow, <clears throat> to grow the size in the market is, is going to be an element of uh, market share. You do X revenue, your competitor does Y revenue. What does that mean in market share? Uh, and so size matters, and that's what uh, apparently is very important for uh, for Tiva. I, I think at the same time you see you don't see any statements on on their R and D cycle, but you see an aggressive cost cutting program, which basically means their f full focus in, is on Cox and will remain on Cox. So these uh, news flashes. Do uh, illustrate the, uh, the the various elements we, we we've been putting to the table. Um, I think we need, to, in the light of time, to move to the next slide. Uh, are there any questions by any one of you? And um, maybe we should have a, a final uh, set of conclusions in the light of the time. I don't see anyone raising their hands at this stage. Um, building blocks today, um, yes, the patent cliff does exist. Uh, building block uh, uh, two, yes, the, the facts and fictions are giving a, an interesting picture of some erosion, but uh, not a, a very huge, huge erosion. So your return on R&D is, is still pretty high with a few uh, side notes uh, we already been making. Uh, third, yes, there's at least three dilemmas to keep the value of, uh, of pharmaceutical, big pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, in line with uh, with the expectations in the market. And uh, last but not least, there's clear statements in the annual reports and websites of these pharma companies what uh, strategic direction each one of them is taking. And it's also clear that not each one of them is taking the same uh, direction. Um, Yarif, any final comments by you? Well, uh, I think that you actually summarized it uh, very well. I think uh, this is uh, starting of a process that actually started already, and we're going to see a lot of, uh, about it because, you know, you can't connect the pharmaceutical uh, from everything that happens right now around the world with everything, but again, pharmaceutical will always be the way I experience that at least, and we also in TPA, uh, the most targeted companies uh, with those uh, challenges, uh, because I would say that the generic and mostly branded generic challenge is something that, uh, you know, n no industry like pharmaceutical has something uh, like that. And again, the key aspect would be branded generics, return on R&D, and uh, also a very wise restructuring and uh, different in strategies. Thank you very much. Uh, and I hereby close this session uh, for today. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And we, we hope to see you back in the, in the next session, which we will focus on in licensing and all consequences that it has on the business model, but uh, also specifically on, uh, on the transporting elements of uh, 
of that in licensing uh, structure. So thank you very thank you very much for your attention and have a nice day. Thank you.